looking at the critical and contemporary issues facing the Muslim world from different perspectives generating new ideas bringing to you all this and a lot more in Voices from the Muslim World I'm not a fan of Halla and uh, I think uh, part of that because I read all of his works not just uh, the small manifesto book that got him very famous. Some people, I think, are obsessed with the historical model. And that's why this Islamic state means one ummah, one state, one khalifa. No, that's not really. Semitic religions in general are political religions. The first division between ummah is about Imam, unfortunately, the second wave of the Arab Spring will be, will be very anarchist, very bloody, and very radical. Assalamu alaikum and welcome from Ilke Foundation Istanbul. We are honored to be hosting a very scholarly figure from the Muslim world today, uh, Dr. Muhammad Mukhtar Al Shinkiti. Uh, Prof, welcome to Istanbul. Thank you very much for Thanks giving so us much. your precious time. Although it's a fact that you are a person of great renown in the Muslim world, but we still would uh, like to ask the traditional question of knowing about you from uh, your tongue and trying to learn, you know, how your life journey has been in a very brief way and the labyrinths you have gone through in reaching this stage, this position today. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much. I'm uh, happy and honored also to be with you here at the Foundation. Well, I don't know if I have much to say about my own life, but uh, simply put, I'm originally from Mauritania, a Muslim country in West Africa, North Africa. Uh, my education was first Quran. I memorized Quran at a very early age and got a ijazah when I was 11 years old. And then my study is a mixed bag. I mean, I got a two bachelor degree, one in Islamic studies, one in translation, Arabic, French, English translation. Uh, also, I got two master's degree, one in history of religion and the other on business administration. And my PhD was in history of religion at Texas Tech University. I lived in several places in the world, two years in Yemen, 10 years in the United States, 14 years in Qatar, where I live and work now at Qatar University, teaching international affairs. Prof, uh, when we see at your works, I mean, uh, you have authored a number of uh, wonderful works. Uh, when we see at your uh, disposition, you know, in terms of the academic positioning or the positioning in the Islamic thought, what comes straight to our mind is the criticism, the criticism of Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi on uh, Sayyid Abu Ala Mahdudi, over, I mean, almost a century ago, yeah. who who accused or who thought that Mahdudi has mis interpreted some Islamic central beliefs and he has reduced down Islam to a political program. So with your stress on the political ideals of the Islamic system, uh, do you think uh, this also warrants a similar criticism? By knowing this, we would be knowing as well that if Abu Hassan Nadvi was justified in his criticism. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, both Nedwi and Maududi are great Muslim scholars, and uh, I was inspired by both of them. I learned a lot from their work and also from their life. 
As a student of history of religion, I think the difference between them is both philosophical and uh, contextual. I mean, uh, there is something we call in history of religion, the types of religiosity. Religious. Yeah, some people are individualistic in terms of religiosity. They focus on salvation of the individual more than on the social justice, for example, and public life. And this sometimes uh, is a part of our own personality. It's not related to religion. So uh, uh, Sheikh Nadwi is a great pious Muslim uh, whose focus were on, I can say, uh, salvation of the individual, uh, a very spiritual life. He's known for a deep spiritual life and inclination. Uh, Sheikh Maududi kind of religiosity is more public, that what, what, what they call social religiosity. And I think both actually have place in, in Islamic tradition and Islamic. The contextual part is important also. So Nedwi is a part of a Muslim minority, while Maududi is a part of Muslim majority. So you don't expect from someone who's living in the Muslim minority to be involved in the public life the same way someone who lives in a Muslim majority country, for example. I think that context also has something sure, sure. to do. You know, while Halak has been reported to have said that in terms of a political theology, uh, when we talk about secularism, secularism is like the murder of God uh, by the state. So if I extend on that, because you uh, frequently talk about the political system, and as you also compare uh, the freedoms of the political system of Islam with the freedom of secularism. So when we compare the both, do you think they are at crossroads with each other? Well, let me say first that I'm not a fan of Halla. And uh, I think uh, part of that because I read all of his works, not just uh, the small manifesto book that got him very famous, okay. The uh, Impossible State. Uh, and I think Halak failed to get out of his Christian background when he talked about Islamic political ideals or values. Uh, and uh, this is, we know this a very common phenomenon with the Arab Christian intellectuals yeah. because we know them very well. So that's part of the problem. Uh, the uh, the way he he discusses Islam and the modern state is deeply influenced with his uh, c Christian background because uh, I think much of this debate is relevant actually uh, as a as a Ali Izzet Begovic has said for religion to be uh, to impact the world it has to be worldly. To yes, and he said, you know, that what what distinguish Islam from, for example, Christianity or Buddhism, is that it's a worldly religion. I mean, the closest version of Christianity to Islam is Protestantism, because it's too worldly. Also, it's right. active in worldly life. You know, you know, I'm sure you know the the book of uh, Max Weber on on Protestantism and, uh, and work ethics, you know, and the capitalism, etc. So Islam is a very practical, it's not an abstract religion, uh, and uh, it's overlapped with, uh, with democracy in many things. I mean, what, what some Christian would see as a secular life for a pious Muslim is normal life. I mean, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did not withdraw from public life and live an ascetic life the way Buddha did, for example. What I, what I used to say that Islamic ascetism actually ended when, the, when Iqra was revealed to the Prophet I mean, That's when the life of pre-Islam, Prophet's life pre-Islam, that's ascetic life when he was in that cave, disconnected from the world. The day Islam was revealed, he's no longer allowed to be disconnected from the world. This is a point that Alam uh, Iqbal uh, emphasized a lot in his poetry and in his philosophy, this practical aspect of Islam. 
So I don't see anything uh, irreconcilable between Islam and the modern state, the, uh, the way Ahlaq put it, and others. And I see that that kind of split of personality is something related to other religious tradition, like uh, Christianity and Buddhism, more than to the essence of, of Islam. I mean, uh, again, as a student of history of religion, I know that different religious traditions have their own genesis and their essence and their uh, looking at uh, public life. Semitic religions in general are political religions. Right. We just look at Ibrahim alayhi salam. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا آلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَآتَيْنَاهُمْ مُلْكًا عَظِيمًا Allah gave the family of Ibrahim as we read in Surah An-Nisa the book, the wisdom, and also give them a huge authority, mulkan عَظِيمًا Prophet Dawood was a king, Prophet Suleiman was a king, Prophet Yusuf was a wazir. Uh, so that's the this, the the uh, Semitic religions in general. The Abrahamic tradition is political. The only exception in this is Christianity. Mm -hmm. But because I believe is the power of Western culture today, the exception is becoming the rule. So we see everything through the lenses of Christian model or Buddhist model, not through the Semitic tradition, which is the the true or the the main mainstream monotheistic tradition. Right, really interesting. Ustaz, there's another thing which we have noticed, you know. You frequently stress on Islamic political ideals instead of a certain system. Now the problem is that when we look at the Islamic history of 1400 years, uh, the only manifestation, the practical manifestation of the Islamic political ideals we can say is at the time when there was one single territory of the Muslims, there was one Ummah, and we had the righteous caliphs. Now with the advent of the nation states, I mean, we are in a different world, in a different time, in a different context, which uh, your favorite poet Iqbal refers to as when he talks about nationalism. In Urdu, he says, in taza khudao mein bada sabse watan hai. And it means that he says that the greatest of the modern gods is nationalism. Yeah. So on one hand, we have got this opinion, and on the other hand, we come across a reality where all the Muslim bloc is disintegrated into small nation states. So now as a solution, the political solution, we have two options, either to go with the Islamic ideal of you know, ideological integration of these states, no matter how long it takes, or the other pragmatic solution of going with the status quo and then looking for economic integration or, you know, individually as countries coming closer to the political ideals of Islam? Well, I don't see it in this, you know, isolationist uh, lenses. And, uh, no, I think, uh, well, uh, we have problem here of what are the criteria of, of Islamic State right. in definition of Islamic State. Some people, I think, are obsessed with the historical model, and that's why this Islamic State means one ummah, one state, one khalifa. No, that's not really. I mean, I distinguish in my in my book the uh, constitutional crisis of Islamic uh, civilization, which is which was translated into Turkish also, and into Urdu and several languages. I I I, I try to distinguish between one ummah and one state. There is no text. There is no text from Quran or Sunnah talking about one state, that Muslims have to be in one state. But there are several texts talking about one ummah. So one ummah is not equivalent to one state. And this has been uh, discussed by Muslim scholars since the second century of Hijra. You know, when the Umayyad separated from the Abbasid in, in Andalusia, for example, Abdul Rahman al dakhil when he created the Umayyad, state in, in Andalusia, that was the first friction. And he announced, the Umayyad announced themselves as Khulafa. And we have the Khulafa in Baghdad also, that majority of Muslims are following. And then the Fatimids come in the third century and they, and they announced themselves aim of the whole Ummah also. So you have practically three Khalifa in the third century. One in Qurtuba, 
one in Kairawan and then Cairo and one in Baghdad. And uh, Muslim scholars were very realistic about this. I mean, one ummah doesn't mean one state. So I think there is problem of model here. We need, we need a new criteria of what Islamic state based on Islamic texts, no, not on Islamic history. And the most important is political legitimacy, because I believe the crisis of Islamic civilization is a crisis of political legitimacy before anything else. That's what Shahrastani noticed 900 years ago when he said, you know, in, in, his, uh, in his Arabic uh, words, The first division between Ummah is about Imama, I mean political leadership. وَمَا سُلَّ سَيْفٌ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ عَلَىٰ قَاعِدَةٍ دِينِيَّةٍ مِثْلَ مَا سُلَّ عَلَىٰ الْإِمَامَةِ فِي كُلِّ زَمَانٍ No issue has raised men create war between Muslims and drawing their swords and killing each other about any topic more than about this political issue. That's the crisis of Islamic civilization. It's about political legitimacy. What we need today is to solve this chronic problem of political legitimacy. The Wahda of Ummah is another issue. Wahda of Ummah doesn't mean integration. It can be federal, confederal. It can be just an international organization, Muslim inter international organization, like organization of uh, Islamic cooperation, for example. I mean, if, if it was effective organization, it's enough. You don't need to have, even the name Khalifa, the name Khalifa, we don't have to have. There is, we are not required by Quran and Sunnah to call President Khalifa, for example. You can call him President or Secretary General or Khalifa or whatever. So I think, I mean, if we free ourselves from the historical memory and focus on the moral and legal criteria that we find in the text of Quran and Sunnah, we can move forward and uh, get out of this you know, historical trap. If I have rightly understood, so we can be in the nation states model, yet one ummah. Of course, we, we've been. Yeah. We have many Muslim countries, states before, and they were recognized as states. We have even several people who claim to be Khalifa, and, and but still, still one ummah. I mean. right. One ummah is not equivalent, is not synonymous single, with, single geography. with one state. Single border, single geography. That has been, that has been broken since the second century of Hijra. I mean, it's not something that brought to us by the uh, Europeans after Westphalia. No. Muslims recognize the legitimacy of several Muslim states with several Muslim head of state more than a thousand years ago. Uh, even if you talk about ideals, though you may be saying that there is not a practical system, in fact, which Islam uh, puts forward, but when in terms of ideal, even if you talk about the Islamic system, is it not something that is very close to democracy since it lays a great importance on the will of people? Well, that's a great question. When, when you talk about political system, it can be interpreted in the philosophical and moral sense, which means a political system that is based on these principles, for example, the will of people, the right of the individuals, separation of powers, etc., etc. Or you can talk about it institutionally, I mean, political system in the institutional sense. It's a monarchy or parliamentary or presidential, etc. Islam did not advise or order Muslims to follow a specific institutional right. political system, but he required them to follow a set of legal and moral principles the principle in their own political system. So you can have constitutional monarchy, and it's fine. You can have the presidential system, you can have the parliamentary system, as long as based on the principle of shura, that's the will of people, justice, the competence of the leadership, al-amana wal quwa as a Muslim scholar said, mean the moral and practical qualification of leadership, that's what Muslim scholars call the amana wal quwa. Um, justice, freedom of people, uh, no coercion in religion, and that's included, of course, Membab Aula, as Muslim scholars said, of course, if there is no coercion of religion, there is no coercion in my political opinion also, yeah. of course, uh, etc. So, yes, 
Islam has a political system, but in the moral and philosophical sense, not in the it's institutional sense. And that's something that should be counted for Islam, not against Islam, because it gives Muslims flexibility to change the institutions, and they're still within the framework, the moral and legal framework of Islam. And that's why I have no problem. I don't see any problem with the modern state. Islam adapted to the empire world when the world was divided between empire. And I think it can adapt very easily with the territorial uh, uh, state today also at the same, same way. Because the principle can apply to this and to that. Actually, in fact, I believe Islamic principles are much easier to apply in a territorial nation state world than in the empire. Because in empire there are no borders, your, your borders are where your army can reach, my borders are where, where my army can reach, and it's very complicated. I mean, it's constant war, there is no United Nations, there is no international law, there is no recognized uh, border between states. It's much easier today. Right, yeah, <laughs> uh, Ustaz, you very uniquely uh, explain the political crisis of Muslim Ummah in terms of the f clash between four political moralities. And this is unique, uh, I mean, this is your unique style, you know, explaining it that way. And obviously you've got those four moralities as the Islamic uh, political ideals and probably the Arab uh, anarchism, monarchism or anarchism. The Arabian anarchism and the Persian monarchism. And, and the Greek democratism. Yes. yes. So I, I just want to understand it further. I just want you to shed some light on what it is. This is in terms of cultural analysis. So, I mean, when you look at the legacy that we have, that we, we inherited from our scholars on the, in, in the topic of political thought, Islamic political thought, uh, I found that Islamic political legacy or thought is divided between these. It's like, like a tension between these four intellectual streams. There are the, those, those uh, Islamic principles, Islamic moral philosophy or political, Islamic political morality, which is based shura, justice, etc. And there is the historical context. Historical context, part of it inside Arabia that is, that is, uh, was, was basically a situation of anarchism because uh, Arabia has a very difficult to have political tradition, the state institutions. They are very, very, very rebellious people against the state. And when, I mean, people are familiar with Arabic poetry, pre-Islamic Arabic poetry, they see that very, very easily, you know, when a poet said, من عهد عاد كان معروفا لنا أسر الملوك وقتلها وقتالها. I mean, they pride themselves that since the time of Adat, the old Arabs, we are known for killing and capturing our, 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 our monarchs. I mean, humiliating the public authority. They don't believe in public authority. The Prophet ﷺ has a hard time to teach them how to obey legitimate authority. And that's why we have many hadith about ta'a, you know, obedience, to, uh, obeying the legitimate authority. So that's one uh, morality, that's the anarchist political morality of the pre-Islamic Arabia. Arabia. On the other side, we have the Persian monarchism. I mean, Persia is one of the oldest, uh, uh, you know, empire in history, not only Sasani, but before that there are, I mean, empires for thousands of years. It's the opposite of Arab. Exactly, it's exactly the opposite. I mean, when the when when the Abbas when the, when the Khilafa was moved to Baghdad, and some kind of cultural synthesis started between the Arabic culture and the Persian culture, you find this tension between the two, and of course the Byzantine also in right. in, in Damascus. So that's also another political ethos, another political morality that the monarchism of Persia based on on you know just people literally worshiping their monarch i mean the, the, the arab they are insulting their monarchs killing them and those are worshiping their monarchs yeah. exactly the opposite yeah. yeah and we have you have the fourth uh, intellectual stream which is the uh, the greek 
uh, democracy. Unfortunately, I believe for, for Islamic history, the Greek democracy died many centuries before Islam. So when Muslims received the Greek culture, they did not receive the democratic culture. They received the empire culture. After Philip II and his son, Alexander the Great, transformed Greece into an empire also. So yeah, there is a tension between these, of course, but uh, uh, more tension happened with the modern, uh, Western modern uh, culture. Well, that's uh, another story. And you know, uh, I heard you saying a very beautiful sentence, you know, which I really liked, that anarchy is the moral justification of tyranny. And when I looked into the sentence and I, I tried to read through, uh, the, read between the lines of the words in the sentence, I could actually see through these words and in the background see all the Arab monarchies of the Muslim world. And it seemed to me that these Arab monarchies are actually practically using this uh, justification of anarchy for, their, for, for the justification of their monarchies or their rule, rulerships. Uh, yeah. is, it, is, it, is, it, is it the case or not? And secondly, what is more important is, like uh, you know, it has happened in the history as well, to have their side of the ulama or scholars with them, they have sugar-coated the same thing in a similar way, but you know, by propagating reformism against revolution. Yeah, well, uh, this is a very old uh, phenomenon in human history. Every political system... It's in practice still. Yeah, yeah of course. Every, but every political system uh, creates its own justifying discourse, cultural discourse that will justify it. So every dictatorship try to legitimize itself by using religion, by using public morality, by using all kind of, uh, and and that's this is an issue now well studied in 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 West in the West, especially in French uh, culture since uh, Michel Foucault wrote his book on on uh, savoir et pouvoir or knowledge knowledge and uh, authority, uh, basically. So the, the 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 connection between political authority and the producing knowledge now is well known. Uh, Arab monarchies, of course, are a good example of this, but not only Arab monarchies, but a military rule also in the Arab world. So those so-called republics, but they are ruled by military. In Islam, actually, there is no the, uh, there is only two political systems. And this is beautifully uh, explained by Sheikh Maudud in his book, Al Khilafa al Mulk. There is only Khilafa al Mulk, or there is only legitimate rule or, or monarchy, monarchy, which is legitimate. But it, it does, it, uh, her, the, this monarchy can be hereditary or military. Both are mulk in, in, in Islamic, uh, in, yeah, in Islamic perspective. The hereditary is uh, monarchy. The military rule is also monarchy because he's dealing with political position as personal ownership. And that's why the word mulk comes from. Mulk means you own something. Tamalaka, mulkan, milkiyatan. It's the same, same word. So, well, I'm not uh, surprised, of course. Any, any dictatorship tried to produce a justifying uh, discourse. I think that's, that's what we see in the Arab world mainly, especially in the Arab world today, because it's a region that is still ruled mostly by dictators. Uh, Prof, talking about ref revolutions, and especially revolutions in the Islamic world, again, these kind of rulers and their supporters, they use the justification that revolutions in their nature create anarchy and chaos, and that is why they do not allow room for these revolutions. On the other hand, I've heard you saying that revolutions in their nature are peaceful. It is the counter-revolution that transforms it into a militarized, militarized yes. chaos or anarchy. Yeah. So when I look it in the contemporary situation of the Muslim geographies, do you think Egypt and Tunisia, they are the most recent and the exact, exa exact examples of this? Well, uh... <laughs> 
about solutions, I mean, I mean I, I've been studying the history of revolution in the last decade I mean, a lot because of what happened and what's happening in the Arab world, trying to get some lessons of history. And yeah, I was fascinated with some uh, conclusion that I came to through reading the history of English Revolution, French Revolution, American Revolution, Russian, Iranians, the third wave that at, uh, Huntington talk about, and other examples of political change. Uh, first, that there, I found that there is a real alliance between monarchy and anarchy means between dictatorship and mm -hmm. anarchism in general, because each one of them is feeding. That's, that's your justification? Yeah. No, each one of them is feeding the other. I mean, I mean if, if the dictatorship continue for a long time, it, it, it creates the situation of anarchy, uh, anarchy right. because popular revolution. And if also civil war continue for a long time, it gives justification for dictatorship because people will be more concerned about their personal security more than about freedom. I mean, freedom become like a luxury for, for them. So that's, that's the, the logical alliance between the two. The second is, of course, all revolutions without exception. That, that I studied since the English Revolution in the 17th century started as a reformist, peaceful effort to change the situation. I mean, the English people did not, did not decide from day one to kill uh, King Charles I. And the French did not decide from day one to kill Louis XVI. True. Uh, same thing, the American Revolution did not decide to separate from the British Empire from day one. All of them started with humble demands for reform. But the stupid leaders are the ones who did not get the message. True. Or they got it very late, too late. So that's why you know, the English Civil War continued for 46 years, since 16. 42 until 1688. The uh, um, French Revolution continue, um, you can say, about 80 years. Right. Uh, French, France was unstable in civil war or, or something similar to civil war for about 81 years. Right. Until from 1789 to 1870. The lucky Americans, their revolution continue eight years of civil war between Englishmen. I mean, these are same people, of course. Uh, and then they have their victory. But also, because there are some unfinished questions or open fires of the revolution, the Civil War started after that, 50 years after that. And more Americans died in Civil War, by the way, more than those who died in World War I and World War II. So it was a disaster. So revolution are not, are not a simple business. If the demand of people are accepted, same thing happened, by the way, in Russia and uh, in Iran. Uh, I, I, I try to connect the dots here between the Russian constitutional revolution of 1905 with the Bolshevik bloody revolution. Mm. Because the reformist one failed, demands people were not accepted in 1905, it was transformed into this radical Bolshevik Revolution. Same thing, Iran, by the way, same year, 1905, 1906, the constitutional revolution in Iran right. against the uh, Qajar monarchs. Right. And it was, a, it was just a reform, demand for reform. But that, that, that reform were killed, and then you find the revenge in 1975. So I said that revolution, I mean, I mean those demands of reformation avenge Benched. themselves when they are not right. uh, accepted. Same thing what's happening today in the Arab world. I'm very sad that some stupid rulers rejected the demand of their people for a gradual, peaceful revolution True. or gradual, peaceful reform, not even revolution. And I'm sure, I have no doubt, based on the historical precedent, that unfortunately, the second wave of the Arab Spring will be, will be very anarchist, very bloody, and very radical. Since you mentioned Arab Spring, you know, 
generally the Muslim world, we all took the first Arab Spring or the recent Arab Spring as a sigh of relief amongst those all dictatorships and monarchies. But on the other hand, if you look into some recent works, including the book you have also quoted of Shadi Hamid, uh, who quotes uh, Rashida Ganoshi, saying that, you know, this Arab Spring has been eaten up. Uh, actually, Arab Spring has eaten up the potential of the Islamic parties. And this has happened in several ways, obviously, by exposing them to power and then propagating them as failed regimes. And on the other hand of on the other hand, consuming all the accumulated intellect and potential of these Islamic parties, because you know now we end up having none of those parties in the power anymore. Well, true, but Islam is not Islamic parties. So Islamic parties are just experience of Muslim people try to change the situation or get the situation better. And if these parties disappear, that doesn't mean that Islam disappeared or even political Islam disappeared. Because politics is a, a part of the, it's intrinsic part of, of Islam. It will come again and again. If these parties fail today, I believe more effective party will emerge tomorrow. Because this is something coming from the bottom of the society. It's, it's very deep. Uh, coming from the bottom of the heart of people. It's a very deep situation. Um, I'm not concerned about that this Islamic party fail or succeed, etc. I think the situation is much bigger and much deeper than that. These are people who, are, who want political systems that reflect their interests and their values and their identities. Whether they call themselves Islamic Party or not, with Islamic parties today fail or not, doesn't change anything. The depth of what people want will be there and will be like like dormant uh, volcano that will erupt at, a, at a, another moment. So uh, it's not about Islamic party, it's about Islam and it's about the Islamic Ummah and Muslim people. And that Muslims are not exception and the Islamic principle uh, are not compatible with this political injustice that are going on in the Islamic world. And I have no doubt that, uh, that the aspiration of people, if they are expressed today, uh, that they will emerge again. Uh, I just mentioned the example of the Russian Constitutional Revolution on 1905 and the Iranian Constitutional Revolution in 1905, and how the revenge of those revolutions come back in 1917 and in 1979, respectively. When we're going to have the revenge of people who were suppressed and their aspirations were destroyed in the Arab world and in the Islamic world, uh, I, I believe it's coming and it's coming soon also, because also there is now acceleration of, of history because of many factors that we have today in our hand, people didn't have early 20th century. Ustaz, mashallah, you have got very intellectual works on a flurry of topics. So naturally, we have got many questions in our mind and before me. But uh, due to the constraint of time, uh, let's conclude it here. Thank you very much for visiting thank us you, today. Thank, thank, thank so you for being our pleasure. guest. Inshallah, My see pleasure. you again, thank Mr. Bob. Inshallah, see you, inshallah. Looking at the critical and contemporary issues facing the Muslim world from different perspectives, generating new ideas, bringing to you all this and a lot more in Voices from the Muslim World.